Hi, and welcome to Mondays with Marlo. You know, there are people that you come across in your career, a few people, that you really look forward to talking to because you admire them for their life, you admire them for their talent, and they just make you feel good. Well, actually, you just love them. And Rosie O'Donnell is one of those people, and I'm so excited. Lucky that me! You are Lucky here. me! Marlo Thomas! I just am so thrilled you're here. Uh, ditto, honey. And, and you just have all the times you've interviewed me, I'm finally interviewing you. Is that exciting? It is, and I'm ready, and there's no area that's off limits. <laughs> I'm so thrilled. Hit me with your best well, stuff. Well, that's what we love about you, is because you're always open and you're always honest. We have so many questions that came in over the weekend, and a lot of people just are writing in live right now. So we're going to start right away because we only have a half an hour. So this is from Nikki. She She's right there on the camera. Hey, Nick. She wants to know, what's your advice for somebody going into show business? Have you got any tips? I do have tips. Number one is uh, perform anywhere and everywhere you can. Mm -hmm. If you want to be a surfer, you got to go in the water and go in the waves. If you want to be a performer, you got to perform. That's number one. Number two is study and get educated because nobody wants a dumb actor. <laughs> you really have to be on top of it. And number three is you have to be certain inside your soul that this is your destiny. If you're not certain, if there's a moment of, I'm going to get something to fall back on, fall back because it's nearly an impossible trek, and the only way you get through is, is with conviction. Oh, those are great tips. Are they good tips? They're great, great. Like hints for Heloise, tips from Rosie. This is from Tammy. Rosie, I know you are passionate about the issue of bullying. Yes. What got you interested in this issue? Truthfully, it was all the crap TV that was on in the 90s. It was watching Jerry Springer when I came home from school, or Geraldo, and when the kids came home from school, it would be on the TV, and I would watch children watching people who looked like their mother and father bloody each other mm -hmm. for entertainment. Right. Bullying, I believe, started with the media. Fox News is a 24-hour bully pulpit. All they do is bully people. Yeah. People who feel differently than them or people who they want to control into uh, ways that they think will benefit corporately, news score. It's really kind of sad. And our society has become one where kindness is not valued, where compassion uh, is not a basic human tendency, it's innately human, human beings are more cooperative than they are combative. Mm -hmm. That's our innate nature, right. right? So combine that with the fact that all these kids are killing themselves. Yeah. The, the epidemic of suicides, not just gay kids, but kids in general, you know. When you, when you have the internet in your home, it's like leaving your child on 42nd Street in New York City mm -hmm. alone. Yeah. You have to police the internet for your children mm -hmm. because what they're able to have access to is terrifying. And bullying is involved in, in the internet as w well. Were you bullied as a child? I was because my mom had died and, you know, we weren't very well kept. Mm. We didn't, like, we all had to do our own laundry yes. when we were like 10. So all the colors would bleed, right? Oh. And things would, would not match or wouldn't fit. And my dad, he was overwhelmed. He, his wife had passed. He had five small children. So we were, we looked sort of like, children, motherless children. Right. And so we were teased for that. I remember being called a greaser because uh, my hair was greasy, you uh, know, because it's usually the mom in the right, house, right, right, right yeah. who says, honey, wash take your hair, bath. take a bit. <laughs> yeah. Right. Let yeah. me smell your hair. My mother used to smell our hair after <laughs> to make sure we use shampoo. Uh, right. But when she died, that all sort of went away. Right. And that feminine touch, that mother's touch that is so essential, yeah. I think. And in any way you get it, it doesn't even have to be from a woman. Truthfully, there's some men yes. who are unbelievably nurturing right, in that way. Right. I'm sure the guy who did my hair today, I'm <laughs> sure he's a very good You know, uh, we're Mom starting person. a campaign with the Ad Council and the Department of Education trying to teach parents about this issue. Yes. How important do you think it is that parents get involved? I mean, do you have any tips for parents whose child is bullied? I would stand up for the kid. Like, you know, honestly, a lot of when when Parker was a little boy, he went to a new school when he was in second grade. I, I left uh, my show when he was in first grade. We were at public school. It was very difficult being as known as I was mm -hmm. to be have public. So he went through a private school and his name's Parker and the kids started calling him parking lot. Hmm. Now, innately, is that a horrible thing? To him, it was. Yes, yeah, right. He would sob, and he wouldn't want to go to school, oh. and he wouldn't. And so uh, I dropped him off at school, and I saw one of the boys who was bullying him, and now he's a big 200-pound man. But, and I, uh, I saw him, his face, dejected, and he walked away, and I walked up to the kid, and I said, if you call him parking lot one more time, I'm going to hurt you. Oh, my That's God. That's what I said to the kid. <laughs> and the kid's face, like, went blank. And the next day, Parker comes home and he says, hey, he didn't call me parking lot today. I said, that's great, honey. Then the phone rings. Hi, this is the school. Um, <laughs> Brendan said that you said you were going to hurt him. I said, 
I am the mother of four and a nationally known figure. Do you think that I would ever say that to a seven-year-old boy? I did. Because I didn't know what else to do. I know, I right? Know. And You're I don't, not I don't, supposed to do that. Right, I'm not advocating terrorizing <laughs> seven-year-olds, but I am saying that stand up for your children so they know there's someone in their corner. Right. And, and that there's some place that's safe for them to tell their feelings. Right, right. Of, because, you know, when kids feel they have nowhere to go, that's when all the chaos and happens. also they don't tell. That's I the know, other thing. They don't so tell. One of the things that we're really going to work on with this campaign is to try to help parents talk to their children and bring it up yes. so that we know who's a bully, who's been bullied, and who's a bystander because they're all part of it. Yes, and, and I think to talk to kids in a car or uh -huh. to talk to kids when they're doing something else, children don't like the, the intensity yeah. of the eye right, and then, right, the, right. then they feel like they're going to get in trouble. If you can be coloring or doing Lego with your kid, you'll find they're able to converse with you a lot easier than they are direct one-on-one, -on -one, which probably feels like interrogation to a child. What do you think should be done about gay teens and bullying? Do you, do you have any thoughts about that It Gets Better campaign? I love that. That, that Dan Savage did that. I uh -huh. think, uh, you know, I don't know how much the It Gets Better helps when they're celebrities, because yes. truthfully, we're such a rarefied breed. Yes. It's 1% of 1% of 1%. I think it's very poignant when you have like a teacher or a guy at IBM look into the camera and tell the kid, yes. you know, because most of these kids are not going to become entertainers, right? I don't know how much people look to entertainers actually to follow in their footsteps of what they feel their life is going to be. Mm -hmm. So I think it's a beautiful campaign. But I do think that bullying of gays has been a societal epidemic mm -hmm. that, you know, for so long, gays were unseen in the media. When I started my show in 96, no one even asked me if I was gay. Mm -hmm. There was no Perez Hilton. There was no TMZ. Right. The internet was brand new. Ellen was not on yet. Oh, Will and Grace had wow, not started. Wow, wow. Right. When they told me there's going to be a show on NBC where there's a gay guy living with a straight girl, I thought that's never going to last. <laughs> Do you remember Tony Randall did Love, Sydney? Yes, right, right, right. Tony Randall had a brilliant show that was on in the 80s called Love, Sydney, where he played a gay man. They never said he was gay, but it was definitely implied. And there was a photo of his lover who had died in the house. He played a grandfather. And after three episodes, it was pulled off the air because of, you know, people threatening the, oh, the religious sure. right, threatening the Absolutely. ad council and whatnot. So I never thought uh, that gay, human, gay, the gay rights movement would have come so far yeah. in such a short time. No, it's amazing. It is amazing. It and is. I think gay bullying has been happening Forever, it's just now we're paying attention. Yeah, that's right. That's right. We're, we're calling it by its rightful name. Right. This is live from Nikki. Hi, Nikki. Hi, Nikki. She says, "Hey, Rosie, you're my absolute favorite comedian. No offense, Marlo. <laughs> Are you plan on going back to your comedy roots or doing a tour?" Yes, I do. I want to do Ooh. another HBO special. I, I've done two of them, and I'd like to do another one. And when I started the new show on OWN. I went to the comedy club at Zany's and I was trying to work out my material and at one point I started a joke and I realized halfway through the joke as I'm telling it, the punchline is Nancy Reagan. That's how old this joke is, right? As I'm trying to substitute a thin political figure as a, you know, so I have to brush up on it. It's like boxing. Oh yeah. People think, I'm sure you know from your dad, people think you could just go out there and if you were once funny. Don't tell jokes. No, no, no. no. no way. It's a whole sort Absolutely. of art form and you got to get it in sure shape. Is. So. And you got to have a script. Exactly. Um, this is from Alyssa. If you could say one thing to the next generation, what would it be? It would be believe in your right to participate in democracy. Mm. Because I think we've been lulled into complacency and the narrative has been so defined for us by corporate interests that we forget how much one person can make a difference. And I have tremendous admiration for all the Occupy Wall Street, Occupy movement across the globe. I don't know. I think it's about time people stood up and said, this is not democracy and capitalism has become to be uh, has come to be cannibalism and we're eating each other's souls and we're not caring about people as entities we're only caring about the bottom line of money and that will be the end of society as we know it so i would say to the next generation your voice matters stand up and make it heard because uh, we did that in the 60s and the 70s and i remember it well and it's been very very disappointing to me as an almost 50 year old woman to see when acts that would galvanize a society don't, mm -hmm. right? Yeah. After Columbine, I thought, well, for sure, right. everyone's going to stand up now right. and say sensible gun. No, there's never really been a movement that, like this one, which was ignited by the people, for the people. It wasn't planned in advance. You right. know? We did the Million Mom March after right. Columbine. Right. It was planned and there was a logo and there right. was t-shirts for sale. And this one is sort of people just saying, I've had enough. And I do think it's interesting that when revolts like this and uprisings happen in Libya, 
in Egypt, it's the number one story on the news in the United States. Right. When it happens in the United States, there is a media blackout. Oh, it's amazing. And, it and, is and, amazing. And it's marginalized. Yes, it is. Uh, this is live from Debbie. Hi, Debbie. Rosie, will you marry again? Love you and your show. I think I'm going to because I found somebody who's quite marryable. Oh, how nice. Yeah, it's very, it's lovely, truthfully. Oh, how great. And I never thought I would, truthfully. When I, I got divorced, I, I felt so kind of broken when I was like 45 years old. I thought, what am I going to do? I'm never in a million years. I don't really know how to date. And I walked into Starbucks, Starbucks and there was this woman holding a puppy and I was about to get another puppy. And we started chatting. But, you know, never in a million years did I think she's gay. Here's the thing. I had the stereotype of lesbians being a certain look. Right. And, and she's 40-year-old, gorgeous, dressed in heels, Prada. I thought, oh, here, and she looks about 28. I thought, here's a 28-year-old straight girl. I'll chat with her while I wait for my chai latte. <laughs> Come to find out she's a single lesbian. Holy moly. Oh. <laughs> but she's lovely, and I'm very happy. And I believe in marriage, truthfully. I like it. I like to feel committed. I like to feel connected. Will you take your time, though? Because I know how, how much, how ashamed you were when your Catholic family that you got divorced the first time. I was. I will take my time, but I have to have, uh, in my mind, you know, the kind of connection that I have that, um, it sounds trite when you talk about relationships in the media because it boils down to like a sound bite. But you know, there's that song on the radio now, I love you like a love song, baby, right? Uh -huh. It talks about how Sometimes we dream that romance is going to be like in the movies or like in a book, that it's going to feel kind of magical and with symphonies, and, you know. And when you get to be 50, I think you step into yourself and you understand what relationships take and what it means to find someone who has the same life goals as you. Yeah, that's very right. Very, very right. right. Yeah, so it feels very right. You'll be invited. I'll let you know. I'll be there. All right. All right. Um, this is live from Storm. Very, storm field? I was going to Is say, it him? Storm, yeah. How many storms do you I know? I don't know, but it's certainly fitting for this time of year. I remember reading about your experience parenting your son when he was your only child. How has your parenting changed now that you have lots of kids? Yes, I have four kids, um, and I will say that every mother um, I know in private will admit that their first child is their favorite one. And I don't mean that you wouldn't put your life on the line for the other ones, but every time I look at my oldest child, I remember the moment when I became a mother was when he was placed in my arms, right? Aww. So there's something about that connection with your first one that is hard to uh, articulate. I have to turn this off because it's my texting here. My <laughs> friends are texting me. I can't talk, don't you know? I'm on Marlon Thomas line. Uh, so uh, I think lots of kids, you you have to manage your time and make each one of them feel special and I'm all for alone trips. I recommend this even if the trip is something like you and the kid in the car going to take a hike and driving for an hour each way and I'm all for alone trips and alone time especially when you come from a big family. Yeah that's great it's yeah. so true my dad did that my did mom did that. Yeah. yeah. I used to go bowling with my father. He used to take me to the boxing matches. Right. And I couldn't watch it. I was I hated that. that yeah, sound. yeah, the sound is scary, I right? I, I went to my first one years ago, about five years ago, <laughs> and to hear when the, fa the oh. face, and then you'd see the blood. Oh, I like know. I was close enough to see the blood splat. <laughs> but you know what I love? Mixed martial arts. Oh, yes. I sure. love that, yeah. but I don't like the boxing. Yeah. Well, there's no blood in mixed martial arts. Well, sometimes there is well. when Uriah Favor is in yeah. there. Hi, Uriah. <laughs> this is live from Tim. What are your best and worst Halloween memories? Well, my best is any year since I've had kids because yeah. we give away full-size bars in Nyack, okay. and we often have a toy. Oh, wow. So, yeah, so we get a lot of people. And I also buy the day after Halloween everything inflatable at Target. Oh, that. You know, the kind that you could put in the air pump and it blows up and it's like a snow globe with bats in right, it. Right, right. So our yard is full of, That's of so that. That's so great. So I love that. And Halloween as a kid, you know, we had fun, but I was always afraid. Of? Well, there were kids would egg you, right? Oh, yeah, yeah, and yeah. And there was the toilet papering and the... Right, right. Right, they'd steal your candy if you were out late enough. Right, and, right. So, but I love, I love Halloween. It's, it's my favorite next to Christmas. I do, too. I love... I Are love you getting dressed it. tonight? Oh, yeah, oh, yeah. Last year, Phil and I went as uh, Laverne and... Uh, and, Shirley? And, no, no, I, I, no, he wasn't Shirley. I was Laverne I was and, he, and he was the Fonz. Oh, that's a good <laughs> it one. It was great. My friend Jackie, her, uh, my best friend since I'm three, she and her husband have two kids and they're both at college. So she got empty bird's nests <laughs> and put them on their shoulders. Oh, how funny. And they were empty nesters. Oh, that's so Isn't that great. Funny? That's hilarious. That's a good one. Okay, here's a C. Uh, a lot has changed. This is from Marsha. A lot has changed since you came out nearly 10 years ago. What do you think has gotten easier? 
about being an LGBT person and what challenges remain? Well, I think the biggest thing that's changed is just the amount of visibility that gay people have. You know, right. when you think about the fact that there were, you know, a lot of gay people in the entertainment industry who were so afraid to say it. And now, like the number one show, How I Met Your Mother, Neil Patrick Harris, gay right. with a partner and with children. Right. Right. It's become a different world since right. I started. And, right. and to think that I started doing stand up in like 1979, 1980. From, from just that amount of time, we've really grown leaps and bounds in terms mm. of the media coverage. And But, you know, there's still a, a lot of ignorance. There's still a lot of people who believe in shaming or believe you can pray the gay away, which you cannot any more than you can pray your eye color to change, right? You can't do that either. So I think acceptance and understanding and information has increased tremendously. And I think the biggest challenge still is letting people know how diverse we are. Letting yes. people know that, you know, if everybody who was gay turned red on one day, you'd be stunned. You'd be walking just through, right. the, through the Macy's and you'd go, oh my, really? Yeah. That, oh, I did. You know, they, they say it's 10% of the population, but I, I think it's probably more because- Oh, I do too. Yeah, yeah. Be, especially in the creative arts. Right, yeah. In the creative yeah. arts, so many people I know are yeah. gay. And I don't know which came first, the chicken or the egg, the gay or the creativity, but I think they're connected. Mm -hmm. I think so too. This is live from Sue. Hi, Sue. Hi, Sue. I'm 46 and believe I'm at the place you have talked about before with the hormone thing. That's the menopause. Can, the hormone thing. Yeah. Can you briefly explain how you went about getting on the bioidentical hormones? Thank you and love your show. Okay, I was on a program called The View. I don't know if you heard about it. <laughs> yeah. I was on that and I was uh, having a fight with Elizabeth Hasselbeck. And so then I decided not to go back because she was pregnant at the time and I did not want to argue with a pregnant woman no matter how much money there was. Oh, right? wow. Yeah, so I'm like, I'm not going back. About two weeks later, I get a phone call from Suzanne Summers, who I know, but don't know very well, but I know, right? And, and I'm like, hey, and she said, said, uh, Ro, can I ask you something? Have you ever had your hormone levels checked? And I was like, no, why? She says, do you have night sweats? Did I have night sweats? I was literally yeah. sleeping with frozen peas in between my breasts oh my God. and frozen peas behind my neck. So she said, please go get your levels. If you get, you know, the readings and they're low, I'll give you, an, you know, some advice on choices you could make. I went and got my levels tested. I had zero estrogen. Wow, so you must have, yeah. Zero. And she saw it in my tone, in my skin, in the aggravation that I felt, right. uh, and that was evidence on that program. So she recommended this cream. Now, I, I researched it. Everyone needs to research it for themselves. Bioidentical hormones are the same thing as the hormones that the doctor give you, only not synthetic. They're not made from horse urine and chemicals. They're made from plants. They're made from nature. And is it something you apply? Or it's something? a cream. Uh -huh. It's a cream that you get, you rub on your uh, upper arm or wherever you have fat. For me, it's easy to place it anywhere. <laughs> and uh, so then I have that and I have progesterone as well, because unopposed estrogen is you know a carcinogenic right, right. so you have to make sure that you balance it out you have to look at your own history and your health history my mother died of breast cancer when she was 39 i was always very hesitant to do any hormone sure. replacement therapy but i was feeling so bad so first people should go and get the find out what their hormone level is yes you can find out what your hormone levels are and if you're at zero and and you can find out what the levels are between the norms uh, if you're at zero, like I was, you need, it's like a car without oil. Right. If you don't put oil in your car, the engine will seize right. and then it will no longer function. Right, right, right. So uh, I started it about four or five years ago and it has been life altering for and me. And has your doctor checked you through this? Maybe? Oh, yes. Yeah. Yes. And it's been, so it's, all of my levels are like my blood pressure went down, oh, my good. skin, like the, you know, elasticity in yeah. my skin oh, that's great yeah I, I felt so much better and um and you buy this over the counter no you yeah. have to go to a, a bioidentical doctor and they have it compounded in a compound oh, pharmacy oh, good. and there's a lot of controversy i mean i'm people think that it's not right or healthy and they feel much more comfortable with the status quo right of, and and that's your own choice for your own life but i know for me this is what's worked and i would recommend it to anyone well that's great well, well look into it though with your doctor uh, this is from Christine. I'd like to hear more about how she reconciled with Howard Stern. I've been a big fan of both of them for years. Well, this is a this makes me believe there could be peace in the Mideast, okay? <laughs> because truthfully, this man was the bane of my existence. Really? For, well, I don't know about this. Okay, so Howard Stern, you know, has that radio show, oh, yeah, right? Yeah, and I so he, um, 
would talk about me incessantly. Uh, really? well, as soon as my show went on, oh, she's a pumpkin head, she's gay, she's whatever he said, she's fat, she's gross. It, just he did his thing. And he had so many followers. I mean, that man is the best that's ever done radio. Oh, yeah. But he terrified me, Marlo. Really? He was like those kids from high school that used to smoke pot by the gym with the black t shirts. And I was the student council president, right. you know? Like, he terrified me. And so I had Parker, he was a little baby, he was at pre K, and he was every day talking about me on the air and then Parker gets walked in with the cops and I'm like what the one of his fans was on the way to Parker's school to kidnap him oh my gosh called in Howard Stern on the radio and Howard Stern's uh, producer John called up uh, and said there's somebody on the way to Parker's school they know where he is so the police went and got him so now at this point the panic level for me it's beyond just making fat jokes and going through my garbage my children's lives are being threatened right so I was supposed to host the Grammys and I said I'm not doing it I'm not doing anything for CBS because they were corporately connected so um, Mia Farrow calls me up and said I heard what happened can I please make amends with you too I said Mia He's been horrible to me. I, he, I don't know what I've ever done to him, but she said, Rosie, only two people stood up for me when I got uh, divorced with the whole thing with Woody, you and him. And I know you're both from Long Island. I know you're the same. Aww. And I was like, so he called me at my studio, and this is like 98, 97, and uh, he said to me, well, you know, why are you? I said, you scare me. He said, and I was, you know, I said, you scare me, Howard, and I'm afraid of you. And men have scared me in my whole life. Oh my. And you know what he said? He said, I'm sorry and I'll never do it again. Oh. And for two years he didn't. And then when Kelly and I got married, he actually thought, you know, he said, wow, I was sort of proud of her. For, and he kind of started to switch his tone. That's amazing. And then about three, four years ago, I was touring with Cindy Lauper. And they said, would you do Howard Stern to help the ticket sales? And I said, <laughs> oh, okay. And I did it from my house, but I was terrified. <laughs> and, and I thought, I have one rule. I'm just going to tell the truth. No matter what he asks me, no matter what he says. Because, you know, he also goes down the sex road yeah, a lot, yeah, right? Yeah, yeah. So I talked to him for an hour. And he was nice. Not, well, I don't know that you would say nice. He was Howard, but I'm able to hit the ball back with right. him, right? If you're not afraid. Right. And so then we started to like click, and I've been on it. And he's the reason I got the job on the radio. Oh, really? He, after I guessed it on his show, I went to the studio. He called the head of Sirius and said, Why don't you put her on? You're dumb not to. And they offered me a job. I like him because he stuck up for Phil. Well, that's the whole thing. Yeah, he is a good guy. guy. He stands. And up. he's a smart guy, and yeah. he's a sensitive guy. And the story of his childhood, his mother was depressed his whole life, and then mm -hmm. finally got into to a transcendental meditation and it saved her mm -hmm. life and you know I understand him yeah. and I get him and he stands up though at the right times yes That's what I agree I, like about him. I agree way to go Howard <laughs> this is live from Deb what is one thing you've learned from doing your new show for own at Harpo or is it too early well it's we, we did three weeks so far it's going good <laughs> yeah. uh, one thing I learned is that uh, Oprah Winfrey has magical powers um, honestly, I've never seen a studio like that, Marlo. Really? It is such state of the art. There is never one thing out of place. Everything is perfect and color coordinated. And this, the dressing rooms, the, the studio, uh, the main control center, it looks like NASA. It's amazing what a billion dollars can do. You're not kidding. <laughs> but uh, so what I've learned is, you know, how amazingly fun it is to be back in the game at a time when I didn't think I would be. I'm turning 50 in March, and how much uh, camaraderie there is amongst women, no matter how the media wants to portray it. Because Well, Oprah's really sticking up for you. She's really I mean, supporting you. She it. didn't have to, at no. this point in her life and career, say. She's a real career maker. She really helps listen, a lot of people. She's pretty special, and yeah. when she believed that I could do it, uh -huh. I had a deal with NBC, and I was about to go back on NBC. but. Then the Conan O'Brien, Jay Leno thing happened. Mm. And here was Conan O'Brien for 15 years giving his heart and soul to that company. Mm -hmm. They promised him this. After three months, they pulled him off. I was so disenchanted with corporate America right. at that point. Yeah. I'm like, they don't care about you. They don't care that he moved his whole family and I staff see. out there. They're like out. And then Leno goes back. And I was like, ugh. Right at that time, she announced you know, that she was having her own network. And I didn't sign the NBC contract. I had breakfast with Gloria Steinem. And she said, what are you doing? And I said, well, I may go back to NBC, but I really want to go to OWN. She said, Rosie, call her. Oh, and I, really? Yeah, and I said, I can't call her, Gloria. <laughs> it's Oprah Winfrey, I'm not gonna call. She looked at me and she said, if, if Ms. Magazine taught you anything, <laughs> you're 49 years old, call Oprah Good Winfrey. Good for you. Good right? for you. And here we are today. That's great. Here's an interesting question. Yes. Who was your role model growing up? 
Well, I had a teacher, a public school teacher, uh -huh. and her name's Pat Maravel. Tell Sorry, you. Pat Maravel, and I um, have a school that I opened for underprivileged kids in New York City, named after her, the Maravel Art Center. And um, in seventh grade, you went from elementary school to a four elementary schools combined in junior high. So not everyone knew my mother had died, and there was an English teacher, and he kept saying, Roseanne, do you have your homework? I'm going to call your mother, and I kind of froze, and... And uh, he kept pushing it, and he didn't know, the poor guy. And I ran away from school, and I was hiding in oh, the woods. Wow. And the police, and my brother was in the police car going, Roseanne, come out of the woods. You are not in trouble. But I stayed there because I was scared. And this teacher found out. She was 27 years old. It was a public school. And she asked that I be her aide in ninth period. Mm. And she chipped away at the ice around my heart uh. until she finally got in. And sadly, she died about five years ago. And, um, and you were in touch with her? Oh, yeah. I was oh. part of her family. I mean, oh. I was on her children's godmother. I was oh. at every event. I sat in the front row with the family. And when she uh, died and she was lived, I was lucky in that I had the resources to have her have home care for the last three years of her oh, life, that's right? Great. Which extended her life. And as I was leaving the last time, you know, she said, come here. And she held my face and she said, I want to look at you. And uh, I said to her, I'll take care of those two kids you pushed out. And she looked at me and said, um, you were my most difficult child. <laughs> because I was. I was so broken. And she was Aww. the first person to hug me. Aww. She was the first person to say, I love you to me. <laughs> no, it was, no, it was a beautiful thing. So I would say Lovely. she definitely was. So many people, I'm one of them, were the teacher. A teacher was the one yes. who said, because I was a cut up in school and I had a nun. Her name was Sister Mercedes. And she said to me, I want you to run for president of the Sodality. And the Sodality is like the religious group. I said, me? Yeah. You know, I said, everybody laughs at me. Um, right, right. And she said, they laugh at you because they like you. I think you're a born leader. Wow. And I thought, well, she's crazy. But with her little push, I did. And you won? I was elected president of Sodality, and it changed my life. Same with me. I started to take myself a little, with a little more gravitas. Right. Well, maybe I, I can. Maybe I'm not just the, the silly clown in the class. She did the Amazing. same thing. Amazing. And not only did she encourage me to run for student council and all those things, but she would show up at my games. Uh -huh. Now, I didn't have, my dad was at work. Right. I didn't have anyone there. Uh, she would go to every single volleyball, best. Yeah. I played every sport. It's amazing what teachers can really, do. Really, public amazing. school teachers who often get vilified and who, everyone's thinking, oh, it's the union that's making, it's not the union. It's not the union workers that are corrupting and bankrupting the United States. It really isn't. And teachers are the heroes in our society. They and are. they need to be held up and supported and defended. They certainly do. Uh, this is live from Sam. Hi, Sam. Hi, Thanks Sam. Thanks for joining us. Long distance relationships, what's your take on them? Never had one? I can't imagine how it would work. Have you ever had one? Yes, with Phil. Well, when? Yeah, well, he did the show in Chicago, and I was doing plays in New York. Oh, and you, but you would fly back I'd on the fly weekend? Back and forth, yeah. Uh -huh. Well, that's not really long distance. That's an hour and a half flight, right? Chicago, <laughs> New York. But, it means you don't go to bed together at night. You don't get up in the morning and have yeah. breakfast together. Which so it, is the greatest part yeah, to me. It is. It definitely is. But also, is. if you knew you were in for the long run, which you did, yes. you figured this was not going to be forever. It was just going to be, right? Well, we, we, well, we were. To learn, we were getting to know each other. Right. So it was it was very romantic. Yeah, you know, my mother said, "Well, this will last forever. This way, you're always having, you know, the World War II hello and goodbye." It's so true. And then you have all the, you know, when you only have a weekend together, you're not going to fight. Yeah, that's true. Because you only have right. that, you know. Yeah, exactly. I think um, when you're in real love, you know it and you make it work. So if it's the person's long distance, you could figure that out. Uh, this is from Tyann live. Do any of your kids want to go into comedy, acting, hosting, and what do you think about that? It's the saddest thing, Marlo. None of them. <laughs> oh, really? And even, I, that, even that little crazy one? Okay, but, I have a hope with Vivian. She's <laughs> eight years old. I have a little bit of a hope. She was in Annie at the local theater in our town. She didn't have a line, but she did a cartwheel and a split. So that's good. But she has the personality. She's vivacious. She likes to dance. There's hope with her. But the other three, were you kidding me? And I pushed. I'm like Mama Rose. I'm like, come on. Sing out, Parker. It's like, I'm not singing. But uh, I think it's, it's uh, to me, it was such a sure thing that I wanted to be a performer. Right. And all I want is for them to find their sure thing. Yes. Right? Yeah, their passion. And for Parker, believe it or not, it's the military. And I was telling oh, Marla. I know. I know. For so, it's so scary and heartbreaking. Yes. But it's, I just it gives, don't want him to get hurt. Same with me. But, I, but it gives him such joy and sense of who he is. And he's known it since he was little, just like I knew at eight years old right, what I wanted right. to do. He knew at eight years old. Yeah, well, I hope he gets a desk job. Yeah, me too. Okay, this is live from Cooper. What was it like making it as a woman in a male-dominated field? 
This is important because so many of the women who write in to MarloThomas.com talk about problems at the job. Yes. And 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 so I mean to 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 be noticed, to be the one that's promoted, to be yeah. the one that's taken seriously when you're a woman is sometimes hard. And I think this is a a real important question. Well, I think that uh, for me, growing up in a non-gender identified household, when your mother's gone and you only have a dad, you know, there were no defined roles, right? My brother Eddie did a lot of the cooking and, and we all had to do the cleaning and the laundry. So I never grew up thinking a woman's place was here. Oh, interesting. Right? I grew up thinking you have to know how to do everything right. because you never know when you're going to be on your own. Right. So that was one thing. The other thing is, um, you know, I never was in a position where a male boss could define who I could become because when you're on stage you have that beautiful 30 minutes or one hour of time to define yourself. Mm -hmm, right. When you're a comic you're the writer, the producer, the stand-up and the the audience will be the deciding factor as to whether or not you rise in the field. Right. So uh, when I look back now and when I think at 17 years old I was on the road doing stand-up with 35 year old men in a comedy condo with three bedrooms and the doors that didn't lock and a phone that didn't work because the comics last week didn't pay the bill oh, so God. they'd have a padlock literally oh, my. on the phone so you couldn't rotary oh, dial it. That's how long ago it was. Uh, so you know <laughs> For me, when I think back now, I can't really believe I was able to accomplish what I have. But at the time, I was so certain, I just kept going forward, you know. And one of uh, uh, one of our producers is also a stand-up comic. Oh, really? Uh huh. Vicky, and she said that when she's on these bills, there's like ten comics, and one of them is a female. Well, and the rest are all guys. When, what is that about? Uh, this Wednesday on the Rosie Show on OWN, we have Phyllis Diller for the whole hour, who's 94 years old. Oh, wow. Who was talking about there was only Phyllis, Joan, and Toadie. That's it, right? So then, by the time I was coming up in the 80s, there were maybe 12 female comics. There was Carol Liefer, Ellen, Elaine Boozler, me, Rita Rudner. Oh, yeah. There were only 12 in the whole country. Wendy Lee. Now, there are like 5,000. Yes. So although it's, it's gotten better, uh, it's it's hard when 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 you think that she was the only one. Whenever they booked two women on the show, they would announce it like it was a spectacular. Like <laughs> we have two female comedians. Like can you believe it? You know, so two funny women in all of America. Hard to believe. Right. When you sometimes when you'd go to a club when you were I was younger comic in my twenties, they'd pick you up at the airport with the sign that said comedian from Tickles comedian, and you'd get in the car Tickles. and Tickles in Warren, Ohio, and the manager would go, Yeah, we had two girls here, and they both were horrible. So if you're not good, we're never booking a girl again. Oh my gosh. And no pressure. Oh my gosh. Just the whole gender. Oh, that. Yeah, no pressure. <laughs> that's so terrible. Warren. That's so terrible. Okay, I'm going to give you one more question. We have a lot more, but I'm trying to figure out which ones to do. Okay. Uh, who's the one, this is from Barb. Go. Who's the one guest you would love to have on your show? Eminem, Marshall Mathers. Really? Yes. And because? I think he's a genius. I don't know if you listen to his music or his lyrics because I was a little bit like Howard Stern, afraid of him initially. Right. I thought, what is he doing? What? And when I left my show, I bought all of his CDs and I put them interspersed in a five CD changer with Joni Mitchell. Because Joni Mitchell has always been my solace, my poetic right. expression of my internal angst. I thought she really is, is a living legend and a genius. And he and her talk the most articulately about what fame feels like from this side mm -hmm. without it sounding like sour grapes. Right. And uh, I am just really admiring the way he maneuvered his life and career. Mm -hmm. You know, he had a daughter with his wife, Kim, mm -hmm. and then she had some drug issues. He's raising that daughter. She left him to have a baby with someone else and then couldn't take care. He's raising that daughter. Oh my. And her sister had a baby that he he's raising three girls himself oh my. in Detroit. He's really pretty magnificent guy. Yes, that and, is it. And I've never met him, but he knows I admire him, and he has some lyrics about me. Oh, does he? he? says, yeah, I want to go to McDonald's with Rosie O'Donnell, sit <laughs> on her lap and watch The Sopranos. <laughs> Marshall, my lap is open. Oh, that's Come on, great. we'll watch The Sopranos. And the last question is one all right. that all women want to know about, and that is, how are you balancing? We know what a devoted mom you are. Yes. How are you balancing? You're flying to Chicago. Your right. kids are here. Yes. You're keeping your family together. How are you balancing as a working woman such a hectic career schedule and and keeping your eyes on your kids. Well, you know, I'm lucky. For a decade, I was able to be home. I made a lot of money on my show, and I was able to quit. I was able to quit at 40 years old. And from 40 to 49, I was at home. I did nine months on The View in between. But on the whole, I was there at every ball game, at every concert at school. And now two of my kids are away at school, and the little ones are there. And so, you know, Kelly and I are flexible. We make it work. 
Um, but it's difficult. And, you know, really, when we were divorced, the family took on a whole different structure. And she's with somebody that she is crazy about named Anne, and I'm with somebody that I'm crazy about named Michelle. And so, in a way, the kids have two different families, right, yes. with two different rules. And what we found out is rather than three days and then four days, they do better with chunks. That uh -huh. They could do a chunk like a month at Kelly's when we do Skype every night, then they do a month with me. And then we, so when I'm not working, I have them all the time. Mm -hmm. And when I am working, Kelly is great at, at right. having them and getting them to school and doing all mm -hmm. of those things that, you know. Do you have some, do you have any rules, like there's something you will not miss? Or either, oh, yeah. In, because, because now how do you do that with your job? When I took the job at own, I gave them the kids' school schedule and said, like, I want off every vacation that they're off because I love, you know, getting to go to Miami with them and the right. pool. And, oh, that's great. Yeah, I'm very much of a, a playing mother. Like, right. I like to play with them, oh, right? that's great. And um, so Kelly's very organized. She, like, uh -huh. knows when the field per trip permission slip has to be in. <laughs> she knows when it's pizza day and they need money for... I'm a little bit at a loss for those details. So, in a way, it really does work out that uh -huh. she sort of has them at the, the chunk of school. But I asked them at work. I said, listen, if my kid, you know, has a championship game, I'm going to let you know with a little bit of advance notice, right? right? right. So Blakey has just started playing football. You uh -huh. know, my, my son, I wrote a book about his learning issue. He had something called auditory processing disorder. And um, thank God I found this woman who came in and helped him. And he's like a different kid. He could never play sports because he didn't understand the rules. Uh, but he was very athletic. Huh. So now he's on a football team. And it's so amazing to see this boy who we worried how he would maneuver in the world uh, on the football team, catching the passes, uh, strutting around. Uh, so like okay. those things I never want to miss. The performances and stuff I never want to miss. And, and I'm lucky, you know, people always say to me, how do you do it as... Well, Marlo, look at us, right? We have uh, assistants and uh, <laughs> right. we have it easy. I right. always think of the woman up in the Bronx right. who's trying to get her kid a new pair of sneakers, who's working as the lunch lady and then at night goes mm -hmm. to the diner. As yeah. a, those are the women who should be held up as how do they do it? You Absolutely. Know? But everybody, it wa everybody wants to know how everyone else does it. I know, you're you right. Know? You're right. Because it's, and, uh, it's, a, it's a hard thing to balance. And, I'm, and there was a time when we were told we couldn't do both. That's right. As, exactly. You know, we all know. Well, we are out of time. In fact, oh. we went over time. That's all right. Right. Because I just, we could talk all day to you. We still have thousands of other questions. It's been an incredible chat. And I know you're going to dress your kids tonight in Halloween costumes. What's everyone going as? Vivi is Lady Gaga. <laughs> of course. Uh, she wears a blonde wig and some crazy outfit. And Blake is a vampire. But he usually changes before. He, he puts on the first out. He'll probably be a football player in his football uniform, <laughs> is my guess. And um, Michelle and I will be handing out the candy. Right. Well, that's Dressed great. in something warm because we have four inches of snow up there. I know. I know you did. It's crazy. You may just stay home and eat the candy yourself. Sadly. <laughs> might be true. Well, if you missed any part of this chat or you want to see it again, it'll be up in just a few hours. And tune in next week when we are joined by Janine Tornatori, this Orbitz travel expert who's going to give us great travel trips for the holidays. And everybody needs those. Thank you, dear Rosie. We love Thank you. Thank you, Marla Thomas. You're the best.